Good evening. Welcome to Dome at Home, the Manitoba Museum's Planetarium Astronomy Show. Good to have you here. I'm Scott Young, your host and the Planetarium Astronomer here at the Manitoba Museum. Dome at Home is a weekly live program where we talk astronomy, what's up in the sky, mostly at night, sometimes daytime. We love to see where people are from. So if you're watching us on Zoom, say hi in the chat window and uh, let us know how many folks are watching and how many uh, or where you're watching from. Same thing on Facebook and uh, in YouTube. Let us know where you're watching from. Uh, we love to be able to show our bosses that uh, the time we spend with you every Thursday night uh, has a good reach. All right. We are going to be talking uh, eclipses today. The eclipse that we had this morning that uh, many of us here in Manitoba were completely clouded out for. There were some places that were clear. We've got some images and some video for you later in the show. So you'll, you'll get to experience that eclipse without the getting up at five in the morning uh, kind of situation that, uh, that people had to do. We're also going to be looking ahead to what is probably the next big uh, solar eclipse. It's a total solar eclipse, not total from here. It's a partial eclipse from Manitoba, but it's total through um, the sort of eastern half of the United States and then up through Ontario and the Maritimes. So there's a potential for getting to the path of totality without leaving the continent. You could drive there potentially like people did in 2017. We'll be talking about that as well. With me as always is Mike patrolling the chats and uh, marshalling the questions and things like that. We do questions at the end of the show and Mike will be getting all those ready. Mike, you out there? I am indeed, Scott. Good evening. Good hello to everybody out there. Nice to see you again. The, um, were you up first thing this morning to, uh, to see if the sky miraculously cleared? I, I did uh, manage to get myself uh, awake, um, but uh, one quick glance out the window told me that I could probably get just a couple more hours sleep instead. So uh, that is the unfortunate thing of uh, the hobby of uh, stargazing or sky watching. You gotta, gotta deal with those clouds. Yeah, and it, it looks like people are checking in from all around the province. Our viewers also saying uh, no luck in the Beausajour area. Abby and Kyla were up. Um, and yeah, it was, it was cloudy pretty much the entire province except for a couple of spots. So we'll, uh, we'll get into that. That's the way it goes. I mean, uh, unless you have your own airplane and can last minute fly to a nice clear spot, you're sometimes stuck with the clouds. But luckily astronomy is a global phenomenon now with uh, the internet, we can, we can watch live. In fact, I, I did catch some of the live feed from uh, St. John's New Brunswick, New Brunswick early this morning and that was great to see. Um, but then I went back to bed and because I knew I could watch it, you know, after the fact. So that's what we're going to do today. All right. Um, oh, Mike is much louder than Scott, says Bonnie. Well, we can't have that. So I'm going to just turn up my volume a little bit and I'm going to, I can't turn down Mike, I guess. That's okay. Oh, I can't turn myself up, down. There we go. Okay. So, all right. Let's get right into the show. Um, we got a bunch of mail uh, over the course of the week. Lots of requests for how to um, observe the solar eclipse. Uh, still some requests looking for solar eclipse glasses and things like that. With COVID, there just wasn't any, so sorry about that. Um, but we, uh, we also got some questions in. Uh, Bo sent us some questions, and I'm going to answer one of those a little bit later in the show. We... Uh, Let's see, we also have coming up, uh, we had a few questions on our bin Stargazing with Binoculars workshop. That's coming up this Sunday at one o'clock or this Tuesday at seven o'clock. Those are programs offered through the Manitoba Museum. You can get your tickets through their website there. And basically we're gonna spend two hours talking about binoculars and how to use them for stargazing. Since telescopes are hard to come by right now, this is sort of a perfect time for us to jump in with binoculars. And it really is a great introduction sort of a, a transition from observing the sky with just your eyes to observing with a telescope. Binoculars are sort of right in the middle there, the sweet spot of ease and convenience and still power. So we'll be doing those. You can uh, check that out on the Manitoba Museum webpage. And I think other than that, we are ready to jump into the sky. So as you know, it's summertime, long summer days short summer nights and they don't start till really late. It's not dark until 10 o'clock 
and even then the sky is pretty bright. Here we are just a little bit after 10 o'clock. The sun has gone down way in the northwest. And the first star that you see, if you have a nice clear horizon, the brightest thing in the sky will be the planet Venus. It is visible low in the west northwest after sunset. It's only visible for maybe half an hour though. And if you've got buildings and trees in that direction, you won't see it. It's very, very low, but it is very, very bright. So it is something that uh, you should be able to spot if you get a good, um, get a good view. As it gets darker, Venus will disappear below the horizon. And by the time all the other stars come out, Venus is pretty much gone. Mars is still sticking around though. Actually, I'll, I'll jump back here uh, a little bit and we'll just adjust the time a little bit more finely. There we go. Just as Venus is setting, Mars becomes visible out of the twilight. This is Mars right here, a very faint object, kind of in a crooked line with the two stars, Cass Castor and Pollux, the two stars in Gemini, the twins. Here, here we'll zoom in a bit more there. You probably wouldn't even notice Mars if Ge the Gemini twins weren't sort of lined up with it, because it's pretty faint, but still technically visible. And as the month goes on, essentially Venus is going to be staying in that part of the sky, but all the other objects are going to be sinking down and to the right. And so later on in the month, Venus and Mars will actually pass each other and uh, get fairly close. That'll be tough to see because it's down low, but still kind of a neat thing to, uh, to observe. Okay, um, Kylo just asked, can you see Venus well in the telescope at that time or is it too bright? Well, when things are low down on the horizon, you have to basically look through a lot of the Earth's atmosphere. And that's what distorts our view of planets. Basically, um, if we were in space, like the Hubble Space Telescope, you get a perfectly clear, stable view. But here on Earth, there's heat waves and inversion layers and clouds and pollution and, and all that kind of stuff. And it makes the air kind of like a swimming pool and it moves the light all over the place. And so the light that's coming in from the planets gets distorted by the atmosphere. And when you look at it with a telescope and you magnify the image, you're also magnifying that distortion. And that distortion is always greatest when an object is down low in the sky. So Venus right now, not a great time to look at it, not because it's too bright, but just because it's too low. If it's higher in the sky, that's a better time to, uh, to look at that. All right. Um, so Venus and Mars in the early evening, and we'll just let it get a little darker here. We'll get this to, uh, you know, 11 o'clock or so when it's finally actually dark. The constellations that we've been touching on each week are still out there, slowly changing over the course of the, uh, of the season. There we go. Those turned on. The sort of springtime constellations are already starting to disappear. There's Leo the lion over there, the sickle or the backwards question mark that marks his head, and then the body and then the tail down to there. Cancer the crab is already sinking below the horizon. It's over where Mars is. Our Big Dipper is still up there, nice and still relatively high over in the Northwest. It's looped all the way around since, uh, since the show the shows that we were doing in January. And it's basically now on the, the other side of the celestial sphere from, uh, from where it was when we started, but still a very, very useful signpost. Let's just move towards the south here. I tried to um, adjust my screen so that you could see more of the sky and it doesn't seem to be working quite as smoothly as I had hoped, sorry about that. There's Arcturus, the bright star, high up in the south at this point, um, at the bottom of Boates, the, uh, the herdsman, kind of looks like a tie or an ice cream cone. Uh, I'm seeing a, a couple of people talk about um, the image being blurry. It's, uh, it's getting up to the internet quite, uh, quite clear, so it must be coming down on, on your side. Something I found out that we discovered is that um, if I'm doing a show or if I'm watching a show and then everybody else in the family is streaming TV or internet or YouTube or whatever, it tends to cut down on the video quality. So you might want to check, uh, check some things like that. Um, 
and Vivian, Vivian just suggested an idea for a future episode, Planet X or Planet Nine, undiscovered planets in our solar system, I guess. So that's, uh, that's a cool idea. We'll have to talk about that. Okay, moving over to the Eastern sky, we still have our summer constellations coming up. The three stars of the summer triangle, Vega up at the top there, Altair down at the bottom, and then Deneb over here. The summer triangle looking like a nice big slice of pizza in the sky using the brightest stars of each of those constellations. That's going to be your signpost for basically the rest of the summer. It's going to be visible. It really sort of dominates the sky. It covers a big chunk of the sky. And as we saw last week, the Milky Way sort of runs right through it. And so if you're under a dark sky away from the, um, away from the uh, city, um, you'll be able to see the Milky Way going right through that area as well. And let's see, yeah. Mike, when you have a second, there's a couple more questions uh, from Phil in the um, Zoom chat. Yeah, that, yeah, uh, okay. maybe you can, yeah. Okay. awesome, cool, thanks. All right, uh, so coming up this week, I gotta say in terms of celestial events, there isn't, other than the eclipse this morning, there isn't another big event that it's sort of like do or die you have to be out at a certain time at a certain night. And that's kind of good. Whenever it's clear, you can get out and, and look at the sky. Even though it's not till late, you can, you can get a pretty decent view of the sky. And uh, it's nice to get out over the next week or so. We'll have the moon visible in the, uh, the evening sky. And so um, that'll be uh, nice to watch as well. Let's see here. Um, one of our... Um, friends at Oakenwald a School. They sent us a whole bunch of questions and we've been trying to answer those in the show for the la last little while. Um, one of the questions was, uh, when did I start to acknowledge the stars and how beautiful they are? And when did I see my first constellation? Um, and I think I talked a little bit about this last time with the, the solar eclipse was one of my first big things. And um, also the um, the other thing was that I went to the planetarium when I was probably eight or nine with one of our school field trips. And I just sort of fell in love with the, the big dome theater and the, the, the crazy robot machine in the middle, Marvin the star machine, and uh, really just got to enjoy that. And then I joined an astronomy club that was running and uh, got involved that way and just sort of went from there. So it started for me pretty young, but that's the great thing about being in school. You get to try a whole bunch of different things. And hopefully everybody finds something that they're excited and passionate about. So hopefully that'll, uh, that'll happen for you folks out there in Oakenwald. So thanks for the question. And we'll get to more of your questions a little bit, uh, a little bit later on. Okay, without further ado, let us talk about the eclipse that was. This is the weather uh, satellite image for the time of the eclipse, for sunrise when the eclipse was going to happen. That blue star there, that's where Winnipeg is, under a giant cloud that essentially covers all of Canada. And the eclipse was partial for pretty much the entire eastern half of the country, but it was also um, what we call annular or ring-shaped for a zone that basically started over here in Ontario. Can you see my cursor there? No, it started in Ontario and basically went straight up um, over Hudson's Bay and up to the North Pole kind of thing, almost cloudy all the way. So not many people saw the, the full annular eclipse, although I did see something on Facebook today. Uh, one of the videographers at CBC Nunavut did get a clear patch and got a great view of the eclipse. So you, uh, we couldn't link to that image, unfortunately, but if you go to CBC Nunavut's page on Facebook, there's a great shot of totality, essentially, the, the central Part of the eclipse where the moon is completely inside and the ring of the sun is just this this really strange ring so that's a great shot um this was the kind of view that you got from the winnipeg area this is a, a shot that our uh, our friend kelly took she got up nice and early went out to the a perfect location this this would have been a perfectly flat horizon to get the the sun rising it was cloudy, but she was taking pictures anyway. Um, so you've got the bright spot up there near the top that is the sun. She took a whole bunch of pictures and didn't think she got anything. But then when she got back, she actually looked at the, the, the pictures, you know, in a, in a 
on a better screen. And here's one of her shots blown up. You can actually see kind of through the clouds, the um, left side of the, of the sun is blocked out by something. And basically the, that's the shadow of the moon, not being cast on the earth, but being cast on the clouds up above. So this is a pretty cool shot actually. It actually captures the fact that the eclipse is happening. Um, so well done Kelly, especially for getting up and, and getting out there, even though it was totally cloudy. So well done. Here we zoomed in on the weather map. There's Winnipeg again. And if you notice right up at the very top, there's a couple of clear patches up by Churchill. And um, one, of the, uh, one of the folks that I uh, saw online was Bill Fong, who's up in Churchill. And Bill was out, got a great view right along the coast there, uh, had some clouds near the bottom, um, but did manage to get a few eclipse shots. Up near Churchill, the, the eclipse was almost 85% coverage. And so you got most of the sun covered. Whereas here in Winnipeg, it would have been only about half eclipse. So that's, uh, that's basically that. But he managed to get a nice sequence of the, the moon going through there. And so the eclipse was seen from somewhere in Manitoba. So I'm glad to see that. It was you know still around five in the morning. So it was early. It's a, it was a tough thing to get up and, and get. But, uh, but thanks to Bill for letting us use his images. Really nice to do that. Out east, you probably notice that there's some clear skies. So Toronto, Montreal, Ottawa, Quebec, the whole uh, southern, uh, south, uh, southern Ontario, got pretty good views. You've probably seen piles and piles of shots of the, the eclipsed sun rising with the CN Tower in the background. Apparently there's this one park that lines up with the CN Tower and the eclipse and the, this park and it was just full of hundreds of people that had all come to the same conclusion that they needed to go there and, and take pictures. So lots of, uh, lots of socially distanced photographers early in the morning. It was also clear way out in St. John, New Brunswick where a friend of the show, uh, Chris from Astronomy by the Bay, that's a YouTube um, program that runs uh, every Sunday night. They sort of talk about what to do with your telescope. It's a little bit more of an advanced show where you're, they're getting into how to, how to maintain your telescope and how to do um, you know, higher end kind of imaging and that kind of stuff. Great guys. And they do a lot of live feed observing. He was up at about three o'clock our time streaming the uh, video of the eclipse. So I put together a, a brief little loop of the 90 minute um, video that they shot. And this was the view from St. John, New, Br New Brunswick. And uh, they saw the whole eclipse. Um, it was great to, to I, I tuned in for a little bit. Like I see, I wanted to see it live a little bit. They had a pretty good view, almost as good as the, the folks in Churchill, but they had perfectly clear skies, which was really nice. Because they were farther east, the eclipse actually didn't start before sunrise for them. The sun actually rose and then the eclipse started. So they got to see literally the entire sequence. Whereas in Manitoba, if it had been clear, we would have just caught the, the end of it, basically the last two or three frames of this sequence is all that we would see. So if any place was gonna be clear, New Brunswick was a great place for it to be clear. So, so thanks to Chris and the Astronomy by the Bay folks because uh, they were out there, they, they had to go to a remote location. So they had uh, one phone in the telescope for Facebook and one phone in the telescope streaming to YouTube and they had to run back and forth. And uh, it was pretty complicated uh, stream, especially that early. So, uh, so well done boys. And uh, thanks for letting us use your footage because uh, I have to say we missed it. Check out their, uh, their YouTube channel. They've got lots of great stuff, especially if you're into telescopes and um, that kind of stuff. And they're just super friendly guys. So definitely check out Astronomy by the Bay. Okay. Those are the images that we have from this morning. And I'm sure you've seen no end of, of images from the rest of things. Let's talk a little bit about the next eclipse. And the next eclipse is going to be oops, uh, 2024, April the 8th, 2024. That seems like a long time away, but it's less than three years. And for the 2017 eclipse, hotels were sold out two years in advance pretty much everywhere. So let's take a look at the path of this upcoming eclipse, because it is going to be the best eclipse for Manitobans 
for the next long period. So the darkest red line there, that's the line of totality. That's the place that you really want to be because that's where the moon completely blocks out the sun and you get to see the beautiful corona, the, the sort of once in a lifetime view, the jaw, uh, jaw dropping view that, that is amazing. Outside of the dark red line, you, you see a partial eclipse. And so, it, you know, here in Winnipeg, it's not going to be much different than what we saw or didn't see this morning. You know, a, a kind of interesting event, the moon moving across the sun, but you don't get that totality. But look, it's not that far from here to here. And I'm assuming by 2024, the borders are going to be open, travel restrictions are going to be off, you'll be able to drive or transport yourself to totality. In 2017, a lot of folks drove down into the central United States. I would say thousands of people actually drove down to see the eclipse and it was magnificent, totally worth the trip. My kids um, still talk about that trip and they're already planning for 2024 because they want to see another one. So that's, that's pretty cool. The weather all along this path, I mean, it's April. April showers bring May flowers, as they say. Well, April showers also make it hard to see eclipses. So you might not want to go to places that are going to be rainy. It looks like the path up in the northern part, the weather prospects are not as good. So while it might be nice to go to Toronto or Ottawa and, you know, stay in Canada and, and, uh, and see it from there, the weather prospects are maybe not the best. Farther south, though, once you get down into sort of the, the deserty areas, you got, um, you know, down in Texas, um, you basically wind up with nice dry skies, and that helps a lot. In fact, um, Mike and I were talking just before the show, and uh, Mike was talking about, uh, where was it uh, in Mexico or something you were thinking, Mike, was a, a good spot to be? Yeah, well, just right, you can see at the very bottom of your map there, uh, the, the totality uh, actually starts uh, just in the yeah in the Pacific Ocean, and uh, right uh, right there where it uh, almost hits the west coast. Uh, that's actually I think it's Acapulco is there, so a oh, fairly yeah. uh, popular uh, tourist destination. Uh, but I know there's also a few cruise lines that are planning special eclipse cruises uh, and are going to be in the uh, near under totality during that time. And cruises uh, cruise ships have the the unique ability to be able to travel to you know a clear spot very quickly uh, and they've got all the best satellite and radar technology available to them uh, and so they they're actually one of the the best ways to see an eclipse uh, although probably the most expensive as well yeah now you've done a, an eclipse cruise back a, a while back hey eh? yeah back in 1999 uh, we uh, we hosted uh an eclipse cruise to the Black Sea uh, and saw uh, the totality there. It was an amazing experience uh, to be on board a cruise ship uh, and seeing that event. So yeah, I've done that. Nice. Yeah. So there's a bunch of different ways to do it um, from, you know, the, the high end kind of things. And I'm sure there are a number of, of charter planes and cruise ships and things like that all the way down to uh, in 2017, we used a little tent trailer and we drove down took three days to drive down to Nebraska. You could probably get to uh, the path of totality in, in two or three good days of driving. And so you could make it, uh, make it uh, possible. So the, the, the path of totality, actually the edge of it is right on Toronto. And I, I um, will just zoom in here a little bit. This is a, this is a great uh, website called Time and Date. You'll notice that it's actually just into the lake where the totality is. So if you were in Toronto, you would literally get like a 99% eclipse, but that's enough. That's enough. That 1% of sun is enough to wash out all the Corona. And it, it's, it's still just a partial eclipse. It's like not, if you live in Toronto, find a way to get across this line and get into the dark red zone, whether it's going down to Hamilton or going on a boat um, or getting across to New York or, or whatever, because it's certainly not at all the same thing. 99.9% .9 eclipse is still a partial eclipse. Only a total eclipse gives you that, that magical view. So you've got places like Rochester in the, in the path, Brockville, Cornwall, Montreal's just right on the edge. But like I say, the weather along there might be a little bit dicey. And then it goes out into, uh, out into the Maritimes. So um, actually our friends from, uh, from Astronomy by the Bay will probably be in the path of totality for that one. It's just a short drive for them. 
So that'll be uh, probably a live stream that you'll be able to watch as well. Well, and okay. Scott, correct me if I'm wrong, but like the, the path of totality, the closer you are to the edge of it, yes, you'll see a, like a total eclipse, but the length of it will be much shorter than when you're at the center of that, uh, of that line. So uh, yeah, it's even absolutely. more important to try to find a spot that's right at that center point of that path. Yep, that is the preferred place to be for sure. If you're right in the middle of this path, um, and there are better maps online where it actually plots out everything exactly. This, this is just sort of a summary map. But um, the center of that map, I think the totality is something like two and a half minutes long. Whereas right on the edge of that map, you would get a second or two of totality just as the moon gr uh, covers the sun and then almost immediately uncovers it. So you really want to be as close to that center line as possible. Um, and then the eclipse does go off. We'll get out here off out into the Atlantic Ocean. Although I don't imagine if you're gonna do an ocean cruise, I'm thinking Acapulco might be better than the Grand Banks in April in terms of uh, weather and fun. So that's something to make plans for. Like I say, places are already, um, the 2017 eclipse made a lot of places realize they have to be able to take reservations more than a year in advance, more than a year in advance. A lot of hotels just don't do that. They, they say, no, we, we won't take them that far in advance. And uh, there were a number of different, uh, different issues there. So make your, uh, make your plans now. It would be a great thing to drive down and see if you have the uh, ability or if you can get into that path of totality. There isn't another total eclipse. Um, actually, I forget when the next one that crosses the North American continent is after that. I think it's 2044. Maybe Mike can check me on that um, and, uh, and throw it in the chat, but I think it's 2044. So if you miss this one, 20 years later. For me, that might be, uh, might be a deal breaker. So, okay. Eclipses, lots and lots of fun. Um, definitely worth the drive. Definitely worth seeing at least once in your life, a total solar eclipse, because it really is beautiful. As much as these partial eclipses are nice and they're, they're cool, we get a chance to see some, something like that maybe every three or four years or, or so, but it's a, an interesting, site. It's not a jaw-dropping, amazing site like the total eclipse is. All right. Now it's time for Cool Space Stuff! So Cool Space Stuff, um, the Perseverance rover has mapped out its first big trek. Basically it landed and it spent most of its time right around the same landing spot. It's moved around a little bit. Um, it went and dropped off the Ingenuity helicopter and the airfield um, there and it's flown around. Now it's gonna start driving and going off in distances. So the first trek is gonna take it south towards the bottom of the map. And it's gonna check out um, a, a variety of these um, impact craters and uh, dig into the soil and uh, sample the rocks and all things like that. That'll be several weeks of work, perhaps months of work because this car does not drive fast. They're not sort of off-roading dune buggying up, uh, up the sand dunes of Mars. They're driving really, really slowly and carefully. So that'll keep it occupied for a while. Once it's finished down in the Southern site there, it's gonna head back past its landing site and it's got to skirt around the two craters and the really sort of rocky terrain up at the top there. It's going to loop all the way around to the left to a site that's called Three Forks. That's going to be months and months off in the future. So really that next part is going to be, um, oh yeah, 2024, August 23rd, just misses Manitoba. That's right. The, uh, the path is very, very close. It'll be a great partial eclipse here, but like I say, a partial is not a, uh, is not a uh, full one. That's uh, Mike just popped that into our Zoom chat and uh, I, I wanted to jump back to that. Okay, um, so Perseverance doing some great, great work and that will continue for, for weeks and months to come. So they have that mapped out. The first big drives are coming up anytime now. Uh, China just put a rocket on the launch pad. This is the uh, Shenzhou 12 spacecraft which will be carrying astronauts to their brand new space station that they launched last month. Um, they've already attached a second module to the space station. A robotic um, cargo ship went up and brought all the 
food and water and spacesuits and supplies for the astronauts. And now the crew will go up. They are they're not telling us when, but uh, based on what we seem to know um, about the Chinese space program, the fact that the rocket is on the pad now tells us that they're probably going to launch around June the 16th, June the 17th. Three astronauts will go up to this Chinese space station for a three month mission is, is what we know so far. We probably won't find out who the astronauts are until they're already there. But it'll be kind of cool to have two space stations with people on them orbiting around the Earth. You know, the space age is, is uh, progressing slowly, but it's progressing. I was pulling down some uh, pictures from the next for the next image, and I just came across this shot. This is the Juno spacecraft taking a picture of the clouds of Jupiter, and it's just amazing. This is this is not the great red spot on Jupiter. This is one of the much smaller spots that is the same kind of thing—a big hurricane-like storm. These spots shrink and get larger and drift around and sometimes absorb each other and things like that. Um, we don't fully understand the weather. I see Phil is asking uh, the question about why Jupiter's red spot is shrinking here in the Zoom chat. We don't really know, but there they are storms in the atmosphere. And so the atmospheric conditions, all of those changes, those will basically um, cause the weather to vary. And you know, for us, a hurricane lasting several weeks, that's a long time. The Great Red Spot has lasted at least 400 years. So weather's a, a whole different thing on Jupiter. And uh, so it's images like this from, from the Juno spacecraft that are helping us to understand that, but it's also just really beautiful. I mean, I wanna put this on a shirt or a, on my wall or something like that. It's just, it's a piece of art. Um, Melissa was just asking uh, in Zoom, what are the clouds made of? Understanding Jupiter is a gas giant. Well, Jupiter is mostly made of hydrogen uh, seventy-five percent hydrogen, twenty-five percent helium. Um, the colors, though, come from a bunch of other trace gases. There's water vapor there. There's ammonia. There's methane. There's carbon dioxide. There's a, a bunch of things like that. And how they mix together basically gives all of those those colors and things like that. And they're probably all in layers. And the winds move them up and down and mix them together. So, pretty uh, pretty impressive. Um, and uh, Phil is just saying, so 400 years ago, the spot wasn't there. No, we, we don't know that, actually. Um, the Great Red Spot was there the very first time someone pointed a telescope at Jupiter that was able to resolve the planet itself. It wasn't Galileo. It was a guy after Galileo by a couple of years. So around 400 years ago, the Great Red Spot was already there. It could have been there a million years. We, we really don't know. But that's as long as we've we've uh, observed it because that's as long as we've had telescopes that could show it. Okay, so Jupiter is sort of only the side um, topic for this cool space stuff stuff because Jupiter's largest moon Ganymede was in the, in the highlights. The Juno spacecraft loops around Jupiter and zooms in close to get great pictures, but then it zooms out. And um, as it orbits around, sometimes it can get closer to the moon. So we got some really close up views of the moon Ganymede, the largest moon in the solar system. It's bigger than the planet Mercury. This is, this is basically a planet-sized world that just happens to orbit around Jupiter rather than around the sun. Um, rocky world covered in craters, lots of ice. We suspect that probably under the surface, there is enough uh, liquid water there to have an ocean that covers the entire moon. So just like Europa, Ganymede and some of the other Jupiter moons have the same kinds of kind of um, situation. There's potentially an ocean of liquid water underneath the surface. You really need to see these pictures close up. Go to the uh, to the NASA, just search NASA Jupiter or NASA Juno, and you'll find these pictures. You really need to put them on your big screen and blow them up and zoom in because the detail is just amazing. We've never had this level of detail on Ganymede before. So it's one more moon that we're starting to lear learn about. Okay. We're gonna get to question time. And so Mike, we'll, we'll start uh, marshalling the various questions that have been uh, in the chats here, here on Zoom and also on Facebook and YouTube. Before we get to those, I, uh, I got a bunch of great questions from, uh, from our friend Bo who was, was watching and had a bunch of questions. One of them was how big are the spaceships that we send people to the planets in and stuff like that. 
Well, back a couple of years in the science gallery, I actually built uh, some models and then our designer at the museum, um, Jay Abenj, put together a model of the museum itself to the same scale. So down at the bottom there, on the bottom right, you can actually see the museum building and then Alloway Hall, which is the low flat building that uh, that's where we keep our temporary exhibits, like when the dinosaurs were here or when there was um, the pirate exhibit or things like that. That's in that hall. And then the little green round thing, that's the planetarium dome. And then these rockets beside it are all done to the same scale. So that's, that's the actual size of them compared to the museum dome. So I particularly like the connection that the, the Apollo moon rocket, that big tall white one there, its business end where all the engines are is basically the same diameter as the planetarium dome, 18 meters or so, 60 feet across. So you could put the Apollo moon rocket and it would basically be the diameter of the planetarium, but it would be as tall as the buildings at Portage and Maine. So massive, massive structures. And even these other ones, the, the Vostok and the, the, the Mercury spacecrafts and things like that, even those rockets are pretty big. They're all pretty much as tall as the museum building. So that's how, uh, that's one way of showing how big the spacecraft are. And uh, Bo, I'll get to the other, your other questions. I'll send you another email back and uh, I'll answer the rest of those. But I wanted to do this one on the show because we did have a great uh, a great image for it. Okay, Mike, let's uh, get to some questions here. What have you been collecting from the group? Yeah, uh, uh, where should we start here? Um, on Facebook, sorry, I'm just trying to find it because it was really early on when we were talking about weather and how it impacts our ability to see uh, things up in the sky. Uh, so Tiffany on Facebook was asking, uh, does the average or do the average sky conditions play a role in where major observatories are located? Uh, for example, where more sunny days happen, does that mean a better location? Oh, that's a, that's a very good point. Yes and no. There, there are two factors that, that factor into these. One of them is the weather, but the more important one is actually the altitude. They tend to put major observatories on tops of mountains because then they're up above most of the air. So if you're up above the cloud layer on the top of a mountain, you, you don't care if it's cloudy or clear down below you. So there, that really improves the, uh, the uh, number of nights that they can do observing. But for smaller and medium-sized observatories where maybe they can't afford to you know, go to a mountaintop in Hawaii or something like that, they definitely try and pick spots where you're in a nice dry area where you've got good wind conditions. Like for example, anybody that uh, has ever come across the, the lake effect snow squalls that come in uh, off of Lake Winnipeg, you know that probably you know, to the southeast of Lake Winnipeg might not be the best place to put an observatory because all of that wind drives the snow off the lake and you get this, uh, this weather effect because of that. So there's definitely some, some strategy into you know, where you would put your observatory based on the prevailing winds and the weather conditions in the lakes, but altitude sort of trumps all. If you can get above the weather, you're good. Okay, uh, heading back to Zoom, uh, another early on question from Vivian. Uh, anything special going on with Neptune and Uranus? Uh, they kind of get left out, uh, I, I, I think people realize, of our planet updates, but uh, she's wondering uh, anything going on with them. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, we do tend to leave them out. Uranus is technically visible to the unaided eye without a telescope if you're in a perfectly dark location and you know exactly where to look and then it just looks like the faintest star you can see. So it's not something that most people can sort of access without a telescope. And Neptune, you definitely need a telescope to see it. So we do tend to not talk about it. Even in a telescope, they're so far away that they're really, really small. So they're not the kind of thing that um, we normally say when it's gonna be near a, the moon or a bright star or things like that, because you can't really pair them up with other objects. If you wanna observe Neptune or Uranus, you need sort of special techniques. And so that's when we tend to leave it out. They will be um, coming up to what we can see, what we call opposition um, in a few months. They'll be visible all night. So that's sort of the best time to look for them. But even at their best, you still need a telescope. So um, I think we will be doing a, an outer planets show though one, one day. We wanna talk about Uranus and Neptune and uh, 
and their discoveries and stuff like that. So we'll talk more about them in that in that episode. Mm -hmm. And a, a slightly related question from Phil, uh, I guess uh, prompted on by uh, talking about Jupiter's great red spot. Uh, but he was asking about uh, Neptune's spot uh, and will it ever come back? And you might want to give a little bit of backstory to that one. Yeah, okay. So um, Neptune has a storm in it called the Great Dark Spot because it looks kind of like the Great Red Spot, except it's dark instead of red. It's kind of a really dark blue against Neptune's regular blue color. That sort of faded away from the time that the Voyager spacecraft went past in the what was it, uh, 1990, I think, something like that. And um, then also, uh, then now, we can, we can see, we could see it with the Hubble Space Telescope. Now it's mostly faded away. We don't know if it'll come back or if another one will start or if that was, you know, just a coincidence that we happened to catch it and then it fades away. We really don't know much about the weather of the outer planets. And so whatever happens, it'll tell us something about the way that the weather works. So if it comes back, I'm sure astronomers are, are watching quite carefully to see if it comes back. But if it, if it does or if it doesn't, either way, that'll still help us understand the weather of a gas giant planet. Mm -hmm. uh, I just saw a question come by from Lou, uh, who was asking about the date of the last show. And I forgot, I was gonna talk about this right off the top. Um, we are working on our plans for the summer. And uh, currently the show was scheduled to run, season two runs until June the 24th. So two more after this. We will be running through the summer. We're gonna be doing a slightly different, um, slightly different, uh, I guess, version of the show just because, uh, you know, with people being away on holidays and stuff like that, but we will be continuing to run uh, through July and August. So you can keep us in your calendar and uh, we'll, be, we'll be here talking about what's up in the sky and we also have a couple of special live events planned for over the summer where we can look at planets through telescopes and we'll uh, also do one for the Perseid meteor shower in August. So lots of good stuff coming up. Make sure you sign up to the Manitoba Museum's um, uh, email list. That's where a lot of this information will come out and uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel and uh, like us on Facebook. That way you'll, you'll keep in touch and, and know when everything is, uh, is happening. Okay, we got time for a couple more questions here, Mike, I think. Yeah, uh, one of our longtime uh, viewers, uh, Abby, uh, is wondering what would happen to the ice or water that is under uh, the moon of Jupiter, Ganymede, if something caused it to be exposed? Oh, wow, that's a great question. Well, hi, Abby, good to see you again. Thanks for, uh, thanks for watching. Yeah, you know what? If the, if the, the water was exposed essentially Ganymede is like a a ball of, of water and the outside of it is touching outer space so it's really cold so the outside of the water just freezes solid if there was a crack in that ice maybe a, an asteroid comes in and crashes and makes a big crater and and exposes some of the water that water would be exposed to the vacuum of outer space and so you would probably get a little bit of a geyser of water vapor as it as it quickly evaporates um, out into space. But then very soon that water would freeze and that would plug the hole. So you'd probably get sort of a burst of, of particles out from the, uh, from the uh, exposed site and then it would all freeze over. And we think actually some of those craters on Ganymede might actually show evidence of that. Um, back, uh, back a few pictures here, if I can just get to that really quickly. There we go. You can see that some of these craters are surrounded by, you know, fresh uh, white material that are uh, that that would have been blown out of the craters. So some of it could be evidence of the water being ex exposed. We'll have to see what the scientists say when they look at these questions uh, up close. Yeah, uh, time for maybe just one more. Uh, first of all, I, I want to say, like I put in the, the uh, comments uh, chat on all three of our platforms about the next solar eclipse that will be on the North American continent. I, I want to point out that it's not the next solar eclipse to happen on Earth. There are going to be numerous solar eclipses happening, both total and annular, uh, and of course, lots of partial 
uh, that'll be happening over the next few years. Uh, and so the only issue is you have to travel to them. Uh, and so Scott was looking for the one for North America because that's usually a bit easier for most people uh, to get to. But they're, they're all over the place. And as he mentioned, there are people and tour companies that actually uh, do quite some amazing trips to go and view eclipses uh, in some of these locations. So I just wanted to clear that up. Uh, and I guess maybe our final question from uh, another longtime viewer on Zoom, Scott, uh, Melissa is asking, do you prefer solar or lunar eclipses and why? Well, hi, Melissa. And hi, Rowan, if you're watching too. Um, you know, I like whatever eclipse is happening next because it gives me something to sort of plan for and, and be excited about. And it's, it's always nice to have something to look forward to an event, even though you know it's gonna be cloudy half the time or whatever. Um, having said that, I mean, a total solar eclipse is probably, I would say the most beautiful natural spectacle that the human eyes can see anywhere ever. Like it, it is, it is, so amazing like any think of the most beautiful sunset or the uh, most amazing mountain vista or i mean you know think of that and then multiply it by a thousand and that's how good a total solar eclipse is it's really it's so hard to describe it's why people travel all over the world and chase these eclipses i mean i i know people here in in winnipeg that have seen upwards of 20 total solar eclipses because basically the eclipse map turns into their vacation map and they've been all over the world just to see the eclipse just to get another couple of minutes standing in the shadow of the moon so it can be a life-changing kind of experience lunar eclipses they're easier to see there you know if there's a lunar eclipse happening half of the world gets to see the same view and so that's pretty good so that makes them much more accessible but a solar eclipse oh yeah for sure um, okay, I, I did see some questions on black holes. Um, black holes, we can't see them. Um, and luckily the sun will never turn into a black hole because the sun's just not big enough. Black holes only get made by giant, giant stars when they explode. So we don't have to worry about that, unfortunately, or fortunately, I guess. But um, we'll try and get to some more questions next time around. And uh, if you drop these questions on, um, on our Facebook page, uh, or you can always send us an email. We've got our links here that I can hit the appropriate button for. Can I? There we go. Um, you can reach us on Facebook, YouTube, or you can drop us an email, space at manitobamuseum.ca, and send us your questions. We'll email back, and, or we'll, uh, if it's a one that works visually, we can do it, answer it to you on the show. Thanks for watching. Thanks to Steinbeck Credit Union for sponsoring the show. It's always great to have that. And uh, keep in touch. Join us on social media. Join us through the museum's email list. And uh, last time I checked, it was going to be clear tonight. So get out there. Look for Venus. Look at the stars. And we'll see you under the clear skies. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night.